Well, hello everyone that is joining us by social media. Uh, glad to see that you're joining us this way. You are in for a treat. God has got something for you today. And uh, I was just exhorting and, and commending the people that are, are here part of our, as a part of our worship experience. Uh, the reason you don't see our worship on social media at times like other places is because we do use recorded music and recorded videos to do that, and we don't want to infringe on any copyright situations with that. Uh, but in that process, we have a very strong, spirit-flowing worship that happens here, and the people here really enter in, and uh, it just it creates that atmosphere. And I want to continue to encourage you guys when we was talking about this. Because of that, you're having that atmosphere where the Spirit of God is able to flow. And in that process, He's actually doing things through you and He's doing things in you that you don't realize. If you just step out by faith, which you guys are doing that, and you worship by faith and you just enter in and let the, the Spirit of God flow like He is, there's lots of things happening right in the midst of worship service. Healings happen right in the midst of worship service. Depression gets dealt with right in the middle of worship service. Things that are going on about that is trying to attach itself fears and worries and things that are trying to be in our face as we enter into worship and we begin to exalt God and as we begin to exalt the Lord and the presence of God rushes in then it raises that standard against the things that are coming against us and we're not only getting relief from those situations but see God don't just give relief he gives answers and as you begin to realize this, even as I'm kind of exhorting you right now about this, there's that side that you can say, well, if we can just get to the place where we worship, whether it's even in your own personal life, of, I'm just going to take time and worship God. And, you know, and there's going to be that little voice that says, hey, you can't worship God right now. You're in the worst mood of your life. But that's where the psalmist, which I quoted earlier in Psalms 103, where he said, bless the Lord, O my soul. He was, ex he was actually having to tell his soul, his mind, his will, and his emotions, you're going to bless God. I'm, I'm making the choice to bless God. You're going to join in in blessing God. We're going to worship God. And we're going to start remembering, first of all, all the benefits that God has done for us. And as you begin to do, live a lifestyle along that lines, you will start to see that First of all, maybe the things that you were dealing with weren't as bad as you were making them to be. They were just that irritating to you, and it was making it worse. Sometimes they're ter worse than what you're thinking about, but the Lord's handling every bit of it. Because you're in that process of worship, as you let go of those things, what you're doing is you're casting your cares upon the Lord. Now, the biggest part that you got to do is now that I'm giving you a little understanding in that, when you start realizing, wait a minute, I just cast the care of that on the Lord. Don't pick it back up. I didn't say don't, don't, don't deal with it. Don't speak to it by faith. Speak to your mountain, but don't let your mountain speak to you. Glory to God. Somebody quote me on that. Put me out there on social media. Quote me on that. Glory to God. That's good stuff. Hallelujah. All right. Well, let's pray, and we're going to get into what I believe the Lord wants us to share today. Father God, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the anointing. Lord, it's you that has anointed us, and that anointing here is to remove burdens, destroys yokes. It also says that, that the anointing teaches us. And so, Lord, let our hearts just be open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit today. Lord, I pray for utterance that I yield to the Spirit of God, and that I speak the right words. But Lord, not only give me the right words to say, but Lord, also, Lord, let them come from the right heart. We're believing you, Lord, for, for you to cause faith to, to increase in our lives through your word. We're believing for things to be strengthened in our lives. We're believing for, Lord, for us to put on the new man by renewing our minds with your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. All right, I want to share with you this week about what I would call promises for the life that now is. Promises for the life that now is. Nate, if you want to put that on autopilot, man, I will stay in, in this central area here so that you can work the computer more than work that. I won't get down like I did last week and roam around. Hallelujah. We laugh ever since we started videoing, which we video, started videoing quite a few years ago. I used to be the top person that I, I roamed all over the place. And then I started noticing that it was giving the camera guy a hard time. I'd go back and watch the videos, and next thing you know, there's a, a, the camera's on the pulpit, and you can hear my voice, but I, you can't see me because I'm way over to the side. And, 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 then, and at that time, it was another person running the cameras, and uh, he, he done got caught up in the message that he didn't even pay attention to what's on the camera. So, hallelujah. So, in that process, I found myself moving less and less. And, uh, and, and, you know, I still you usually see me go from side to side, but I move less and less because I was trying to make sure that the camera was able to catch in the recording. So little tricks of the trade there. All right. Promises for the life that now is. If you uh, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 8, 6, the purpose of why I'm doing this is I want to encourage our beliefs that God has distinct promises and blessings for us during this life and expose the falseness of the benefits of salvation being just strictly after this life. We need to get in the Word. There's, the Bible says that we need to know why we believe what we believe. We've got to lay that foundation, and it's got to be based upon the Word of God through a revelation by the Spirit of God. But there's a lot of times where, especially I know many of us have experienced, there's a lot of voices out there that are sharing this word and sharing their opinions of this word and creating a lot of beliefs that creates conflicts within the body of Christ. And a lot of times, even when we come to a church such as this, we've come, like myself, I came out of a, a different denomination that had taught me uh, some things in the word that had their spin on it. A lot of times I am finding, especially because of the faith message and because of our experiences in the world, we, there's a lot of doctrines that try to explain things away or try to make excuses why God didn't do something. Instead of being truthful about it, they say these things along the lines of, I, you know, I've heard this statement, especially when I started getting into the message of faith, and they, I've heard this terminology before, faith failures. And let me tell you something, true faith in God, based upon His Word and being led by His Spirit, doesn't fail. Now, we can fail our faith... We can allow things to distract us. We can stop believing. We can stop doing those things. But in the process, there's a lot of doctrine out there that has explained a lot of the things of God away, and they're just basing it on that salvation is for us after we pass away. You've heard, many of y'all have heard me say when I use my own testimony and I've got my own verbiage that I've started using over the years that, you know, when I first came to know the Lord or when I first got saved, when I first got born again, when I was a teenager, that uh, my mentality was this, that, you know, we're here, God's up there in heaven, and that, you know, we basically are to go to church, live good moral lives, based on the morality of the Bible, and hold on to the back of the pew till either Jesus comes or until we pass on and leave this earth and go to heaven. And then later on, I found out about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that was awesome. And I was excited. I'm like, there's more to God than just 
the salvation, the, yeah, you can get filled with the Holy Ghost. And I've seen people get filled with the Holy Ghost, and I begin to see that that was a true experience, seen it in the Word, seen it based upon people that I knew of, of good character, that I've seen them get filled with the Holy Ghost. And as I began to step out, I, I sought the Lord for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I, I, I received the Holy Ghost. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, filled and with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And even in tongue-talking circles, it got back to the place that I was like, I can live a good moral life. I go to church. And now I can talk in tongues as I hold on to the back of the pew till either Jesus comes or until I pass from this earth and go into heaven. We like projecting the benefits of salvation to the life to come instead of the life that he now is. And let me tell you, the benefits of, of salvation is about the life to come, but it's about the life that now is. When you receive eternal life, you don't receive eternal life when you leave this body. You received eternal life the moment that you accepted Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. That new birth experience, eternal life was imparted back to you. So eternity is not waiting for your, your time on this earth to cease. Eternity started right then and there. So in Hebrews 8, 6, it says, But now, he, now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. See, religion uses this to explain away the benefits and promises for now in this life, and they're negating the power of God. I've heard this very scripture before. Well, you know, God did all that under the old covenant, but now that we have the new birth, God doesn't do these things anymore. Or some people say, well, God can still do these things, but their, their attitude is, but you never know what God's going to do. God's this mysterious being that he may show up, he may not show up. You just, you know, and they, 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 and they use these nice fancy words of, well, whatever God's will is. Well, in this process of studying this covenant, these benefits based upon these promises, the promises are God's will. So when we begin to start seeing these things along that lines, uh, I notice it says that we get better promises. Most people say, well, the better promise is, is the new birth. And, you know, we have it better than they. But I'm telling you, when you're sick and you're getting attacked harshly, or when your finances are going through the ringer because of an attack, I mean, yes, you're thankful that your name's written in the, name, in the, the Lamb's book of life. You, you can be thankful during those times, but there's a side that you need to know that you can turn to God, you can cry up on the to the Lord, and he's going to hear you, and he's going to answer you. That you, God is not just your God of the life to come, but God is your God now. And that you've separated yourself from the life that you had, because at one time you had a life that had no hope, but now you uh, have a life that's full of hope, because now you are reconciled or reunited with God, and God is now in your life. The uh, definition of better... Because it says, is greater than half. So if we have this covenant with God that says is a more excellent ministry and is a mediator of a better covenant, then it's better, it's greater than half of what the other covenant was. Let me tell you, it's way better than half. It's improved in health and mental attitude. It's an improvement to what the previous covenant was. It's more attractive, favorable, or commendable. You know, when you're visiting people in the hospital, and, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm not saying people are wrong for this. I'm not trying to say discouraged, but a lot of times you're going at people 
And they're only, they're, they've got what they're dealing with right in front of them. And you want to go to them and say, well, but do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Do you know if you were going to die today, you'd go to heaven? Well, they, first of all, they want to talk about dying today. They want to talk about living today. I agree that the eternal salvation is extremely important. But a lot of times we have just left off and, and not willing to meet people where they are. And we've done it because either religion has taught us otherwise and explained scriptures away, or because we've had experiences that didn't line up with the word, and now our faith is based upon our experiences instead of going to the Lord and saying, where did I miss it? It's more attractive, it's favorable, it's more advantageous or effective. The, 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 the better covenant that we now are part of, is, it's more effective than even the old covenant. And we saw people being blessed under the old covenant. We got records of people that were being healed under the old covenant. We've got records of people that were prospering under the old covenant. But then we get to this new covenant and we've got people that want to say, yes, we're under the new covenant. So now it's just about we get to go to heaven. And then when we get to heaven, there'll be no poverty. There'll be no lack. There'll be no sickness. There'll be no disease. There'll be no death. I'm sorry, but I'm going to speak real frank and this may upset some people. I'm so thankful for my salvation. I'm so thankful for forgiveness of sins. But when you start telling me that under the old covenant you could get healing, but under the new covenant we're doing away with that, and, it's, we, and we just you know, need to go to heaven, but we're still just suckers to what happens in the world, it does not sound like we're getting the better end of the stick. The better end of the stick is not only do you get all the things from the benefits from the old covenant, but now you also get more because now you're completely reconciled to God and you're not even having to worry about what happens afterwards. You know that heaven is your everlasting reward. Hallelujah. So it's improved in accuracy or performance. It's better. The covenant we're under is better. Somebody say better. Better. All right, well, you are there. All right, Hebrews 8, 6 in the Darby translation says it this way. But now he has got a more excellent ministry, but so much as he is a mediator of a better covenant, which is established on the footing of better promises. I like that statement. It is established on the footing of better promises. How is it established on the footing of better promises? Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. And we're going to look at verses 31 through 34. Praise God. Jeremiah chapter 31, and we're going to look at verses 31 through 34. I'm just going to cheat with the rest of y'all if that's okay. Behold, this is Jeremiah's. Speaking of what God is doing. The days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 
Now, why I'm using this is it says that we have a better covenant and the Darby says is established on the footing of better promises. The reason that this covenant that we have, which is on better promises, it has a better footing. The sin problem is dealt with. It is completely dealt with. He says, I will forgive your iniquities. He says, I'm not going to do the covenant that I did to, your, to the people as they were brought out of the land of Egypt, which is re- referenced into the law of Moses. I'm going to give you a better covenant. And he says, in fact, I'm going to write the covenant in your heart. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And you're not even going to have to tell everyone, know the Lord, because they will have a personal relationship with me because I will forgive all their sins. And he says, I will remember them no more. So next time you start feeling bad, a little side note here, and you start feeling a little condemnation going, remember that your sins have been dealt with and that God personally doesn't remember them anymore. He's not holding your sin over your head. See, under the old covenant... They had all these rules set up and based upon the the rules that they were set up, basically it was able for them to know what sin truly was. And even he says they couldn't keep, they broke the covenant right off the bat. But in that covenant itself, God already knew that they they weren't going to keep this covenant. So he made a way within the covenant for sins to be covered. That's why they had to do sacrifices. And they sacrificed sheep and bulls and goats. And there was all those different sacrifices that you see in the Old Covenant. And it was basically, there was something that was innocent. Blood had to be shed. And it had to cover that. But because of what Jesus did, because he obtained a more excellent ministry, because he is the mediator of a better covenant, his blood was shed. And his blood didn't just cover our sins. It cleansed us. Of all our sins. So this covenant, this better covenant is established on the footing of better promises because the sin issue has been completely resolved. God no longer has to be concerning himself with the sin issue. It's done, it's over with. As far as God's concerned, when you accepted Christ, when you allowed the blood of Jesus to, to come and cleanse you of all your sins, he's like, it's done. I don't remember them no more. You're my people. I'm, I'm like putting my law on the inside of you, which is now the law of love. You will know me. See, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, lines this self up. It says, talking about Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. He gave himself for our sins. The sin issue is dealt with. That he might deliver us. Notice this, this is from this present evil world. Most people think deliverance from this present evil world is when we go to heaven. But he prayed in John 17. He says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, leave them in the world, but he's delivered us from this present evil world. We're no longer a part of it. We, know, we get to be in the world, but we don't have to participate with the things of the world. The same way that I've been sharing with you about some of the prophetic words that are going, there's the prophetic word that's happening, things that are happening in the earth, but because of what's happening in the earth does not mean the church has to participate because, again, I will keep saying this, we are not without God. We are not without hope. So he makes this statement that he might deliver us from this present evil world he gave himself for our sins the sin issue is resolved and because the sin issue has been resolved Abra- the blessing of abraham has now been released to each and every one of us galatians chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 christ has redeemed us redeemed means he's paid the price he's redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. 
that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, that the blessing of Abraham might come on us. Now, I'm not going to get into all this today, but if you start looking at the, in, in Deuteronomy 28, and you go also back and study Abraham, when you start talking about the blessing of Abraham, most of everything that's said in there is not dealing with the life that's to come, but dealing with our life that's now is. During the offer message, I quoted a little bit of it in Deuteronomy 28, that he will commend the blessing on our storehouses. We're blessed coming in. We're blessed going out. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We have all these things that are now available to us. But we've got to renew our mind. We've got to change our thinking. We've got to come to the place that we realize that we have promises for the life that now is. And quit trying to defer the, the favor of God to just when we die. You want me to help you with that? Die today. Are you telling me to kill myself? No, I'm telling you to die to yourself today. Because if any man be in Christ, he's dead to sin. He's alive to God. He's dead to sin and he's alive to righteousness. I, years ago when Juanita and I had first got married and we had went to a grocery store in, in town, and y'all y'all have heard me say this many times that the only reason Juanita married me because we were, both lived in Gladewater and I was the only guy in Gladewater that she wasn't kin to. <laughs> and sure enough, we were in a grocery store and she ran into somebody she knows. She, they, she runs into this with her job now that, that anybody comes up and they're trying to figure out who that is. They say, well, you need to ask Juanita. She's either kin or knows everybody in town. And sure enough... It was true. Somebody dropped their birth certificate out in the parking lot and they couldn't figure out who it was because the person's maiden name was on there. So they couldn't pull up the bill from the water billing and all those type things. And all of a sudden, Juanita walks through there and says, what's that? And, oh, well, it's a birth certificate that got dropped in the parking lot. And somebody goes, you didn't ask Juanita if they knew who they were? And she looks on that birth certificate and she says, I'll go call their dad. You know who that is? Yes, I know who this is. So, but in that process, we were walking through the grocery store, and she really hadn't been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost just right before we got married. She hadn't been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost for very long, and she had ran into somebody that she knew, and they were looking at her and saying, something's different about you. Have you lost weight? No, I haven't lost weight. It's a good thing because she was skinny as a rail when I first met her. She didn't need to lose any more weight. Have you changed your hair? No, nope, I haven't changed my hair. And she's just sitting there and she's smiling. And, and, you know, and I'm sitting over to the side and I'm wanting to answer for her. And she says, no, nothing, you know. And, you know, and after the conversation was over and we got back to ourselves, you should have looked at him and said, I died. <laughs> I died. It's no longer that me that lives, but it's Christ that now lives in me. And so this difference that you see in my life is because the person you once knew is not there anymore. I have been born again. I have experienced a, a new, this new experience that's called salvation. And no longer it's me, but it's Christ that lives in me. And you're, what you're seeing is Christ coming out of me. She died. We died. We've got to remember we've died. Every time we dig up the old man, well, we're back under the world. But we're under a better covenant with better promises, under better footing, because the sin issue has been dealt with. And now we have a promise for the life that now is. The sin, we were delivered from the, this present even world. And now the blessing of Abraham is open to us. And it's not open to us because of what we've done. We didn't earn it. We didn't make it happen. We didn't fulfill a bunch of rules and regulations. Jesus did every bit of that for us. And then after he fulfilled righteousness completely for us, he who knew no sin became sin. 
And he became a curse. And he was, became a curse because of us. It was our sin that brought the curse upon him. And he went to the tree or the cross. And he says, now because of that curse, the blessing of Abraham is now available to us. In Matthew 6.10, you can also write this, Luke 11.2 says that I don't have that written, but just those note takers. Matthew 6.10 is a portion of a prayer that Jesus shared with us that many people reference as the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But he goes into verse 10, and one of the things that Jesus says in this prayer, he says, your kingdom come. We're to pray. We're to believe God. We're supposed to be expecting your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? So you, he's basically saying the lifestyle of heaven, you're supposed to be believing for what, it, what, what heaven is like and what everybody projects their salvation to. He says you're supposed to be praying and believing and expecting for God's will to be done here in earth. You're, really, if we start living the life that Christ has paid for and we start expecting the things of God and as we grow, now if we go from faith to faith, we go from glory to glory. This is not to get anybody in condemnation. This is to press us to say there's more and that we don't settle and we don't lose hope. We stop expecting things. We start putting up with what the world has for us. We start, uh, w things don't quite work out like we think they're supposed to work out. We've even got to the place that we've gotten a little information. We started believing God and we run into some bumps on the road. But Jesus himself says, we're supposed to pray for the kingdom of God to be operating right here, right now. Guess what? You're, the kingdom's here. You're part of that kingdom. You've been translated out of the out of the the rule and the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We're now to operate like, like we should when we go to heaven. The only th difference for us for when we die and leave this earth or when the Lord comes and picks us up and we go to heaven, the only thing that really should change in our lives is our address. Well, Brother Anthony, this is just all sounds too good to be true. No, this is so good, it's God. God's really that big. And God dealt with it at the root, because the root of all the source of everything was the sin problem. And because the sin problem has been dealt with here, we begin to experience the blessings of righteousness here. And we're to pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done. What, just think about, most people, I've heard many denominations, and we start talking about how great it's going to be in heaven. But just think of how often it'll be in heaven. In heaven, there'll be no more sickness. Guess what? In Christ, there can be no more sickness for you. Because he paid the price for that. In heaven, there's no more lack. Well, is Jesus your shepherd right now? If he is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or I shall not lack. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth. Not, not your kingdom come and just endure in earth until you get to heaven. It's your kingdom come, your will be done. So you start thinking about whatever it's like in heaven, God wants you to start experiencing that here now. And then he wants you to demonstrate heaven to the world. In Matthew 6.10, the easy read version says, we pray that your kingdom will come, that what you want will be done here on earth, the same as in heaven. The Young's Little translation says, thy reign come, thy will come to pass as in heaven also in the earth. The will of God come to pass in the earth as it is in heaven. We're to experience the will of God here in this life, in this time, in the earth as it is in heaven. We have promises for the life that now is. Yes, heaven's awesome. 
And I'm going to tell you, I have not had a visitation of heaven. I've had just maybe a couple of, of, of spiritual experiences where I just got a taste of, I mean, and I'm talking a very light taste. I didn't see heaven. I've never visited heaven. I know of people that have. Do you, you, you believe those people? Well, I can't speak for every single one of them, but I believe that some of them had to go. I know it's possible because Paul himself says, I know such a man who was caught up in the third heaven. So, yes, is heavenly visitation possible? The answer is yes. Does it happen? The answer is yes. If it happened to them in the Bible, then it will happen to those now that are pursuing God. And they, but they, those that have those heavenly visitations, they have them for a purpose. It's just not so they can say, Woo-wee, we had a good experience. It was so neat. Let me brag about how I went to heaven and you didn't. Most people that I find that have visited heaven and they had a divine appointment to visit heaven usually come back with also a word. Most of them that I've heard the word usually coming back is, tell my people I'm coming. Because we get going day by day by day and then before we know it, we're deferring, we defer the promises of God to the life to come, but then we start beginning to defer the life to come and forget that he's coming. So our, the will is supposed to be done as it is in heaven. We have the promises for the life that now is with our finances, with our property, with our relationships. In Mark 10, 29 and 30, it says, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say to you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. What does that say? Now in this time. Houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecution, and in the world to come eternal life. See, Jesus himself made this variation that we will receive things here in this time, in this life, and then also we will receive things in the world to come. We have promises for the life that now is. You know, I've seen people that, I mean, man, they're on everybody's tongue and there's probably some people that have gotten it the wrong way. But just because one person has gotten it the wrong way doesn't mean everybody that does the same thing gets it the wrong way. And there's a lot of ministers that are well known and has been blessed as the Bible says we're supposed to be and people are accusing them. And they forsook all. I know some ministers that when they went into ministry, that I, you start hearing the stories of where they came from, and they had to believe God for every little thing they had. They didn't have anything. I know one minister that left all for the sake of the gospel and for the kingdom of God, moved to another place, got into this this hobble of apartment with his, his two children didn't have a refrigerator. And fortunately, someone blessed them with one of those little bitty mini fridges that they had in their camper. So he's trying, he's got a wife, he's got two kids, and the fridge he has for his little apartment is one of those mini fridges. barely getting along, began to accept opportunities to call, to go minister. And as they began to start to minister, there was times that he accepted places to minister as he knew the Lord was opening those doors. And he would go out there and he'd have to pray his car starts. And he'd have to believe God for tires. He said, man, his tires had gotten so bald you could see the air in them. And these people 
have forsaken all. And this scripture says that if you forsake all these things for, the, for his sake and the gospel's sake, that in this life you'll receive, now in this time you'll receive a hundredfold. And now they live a life that of, of, of great prosperity. And people sit there and look at them and say, you're taking advantage of the church. They don't know how they got the money. They just immediately accuse them of that. They don't know if they, the Lord started blessing them and they invested right. I know some pastors that are under attack for their prosperity. But what did that say? It said, with persecutions. So here they are. They've forsaken all for the gospel's sake. And they're beginning to experience this verse to its fullest. They've got brothers, sisters, lands. All these different things have come in their lives. I know some pastors that uh, are, are known for being under attack and they wrote books and those books just sold really well. Even to the place that they're no longer taking a salary from their church, but people are still accusing them that you're just stealing from the tithes and offerings of the church to live a lifestyle while the people that are doing the tithing and offering are living below their means. What about when they were giving their tithes and their offerings and they were honoring God and they lived below their means and we're just seeing the end of it. But what we're seeing is they're being persecuted because of the blessing of God on their lives. Why would I say that? Number one, think before you touch God's anointed. Even if you find out there is wrongdoing, don't touch it. I mean, I'm not telling you to support them, but don't touch it. The other side is, is we're sitting here and we're sharing this information because we want you to believe God for that. But also when you need to be ready that if you start experiencing this, somebody's going to look at you. Juanita and I lived in a... It wasn't even 1,100 square feet. It was just a little over 1,000 square feet house in Gladewater. And because it had brick on it, we were accused of being rich. Oh, you live in that brick home. You're rich now. We had people quit associating with us because they thought we had money. And the ones that did associate with us was there because they were trying to get what they thought we had. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm prospering. Every day I'm prospering. We're, and we're increasing more and more. And I found that as I follow the steps that the Lord has laid in my path, that He's ordered for me, there's been steps when I look at it and I'm like, Lord, you know if we take these steps, that that means I'm, I'm shedding this and shedding that, and that was income for us. When I went full-time at this church, I had to pray about it for quite a while because I, even though I had my heart was ready to go, because I was crying out to the Lord and I said, Lord, I feel like I'm building another man's kingdom instead of building yours. This is taking up so much of my time and so much of my effort and so much of my concentration that it's distracted me from what you called me to do. And as I began to cry out to the Lord, and then he started dealing with me that it was time to go. But at the same time, I was concerned because Juanita and I were the biggest givers in this church. And I was about to lose a full-time salary. By doing it. And I was concerned about the church. I was concerned about my family. Now we had already looked at, it, at what it would take for us to get by. And we knew we would be fine. But I wanted to make sure the church was fine. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. And he says, you will do more harm staying there thinking you're getting finances to support that church than the benefits and the blessings that you're going to be when you step out and do this. And once he spoke that to me, and I mean, I was secure in that thought, yes, sir, I'm gone. I'll see you later. I'm not going to harm the church by staying. He said, you're going to be a harm instead of a help. And the moment we stepped out, we left that. We were just at enough income where we knew we could survive. This church and the income of this church Never went down. We were tithing less and giving less because we had less income. And the income of the church never went down. 
Why? Because of the blessing. Because that's what, how God does. And if you forsake those things, you'll receive now in this time. And not only that, but after we made those steps that we agreed to, Juanita started receiving raises and bonuses and promotions just and we you know we could get prideful in those things Juanita had room to be prideful because let me tell you Juanita is a sharp cookie I try to act smart in front of her just so she doesn't think I'm too stupid for her I'm pretty sure she might not watch this video so she'll never hear me say that none of y'all are allowed to repeat it to her No, we both knew where that came from because all of a sudden it happening that quickly in that short a period of time, that is the blessing of the Lord in operation. That is God rewarding us because we let something go for the gospel's sake and for his sake. And immediately we started seeing the benefits and the rewards of that very thing. See, we have a promise for the life that now is. In Luke 18, 29 through 30, if you'll turn with me there. There it is, Luke 18, 29 through 30. This is uh, the, Luke's account of this same verse. And he said unto them, Verily I say to you, there is no man that has left house, or parent, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom's sake, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold. The other one said, you receive a hundredfold. This one says, you shall receive manifold more in this present time. I'm getting this out of the Bible, guys. Jesus, this is actually Jesus' own words. This was, if you, if you have those Bibles, this is written in red in your Bible. Jesus himself says that if we give things up for the kingdom's sake, and for God's sake, and for the gospel's sake, that we will receive manifold more in this present time. And in the world to come, life everlasting. I'm telling you, God isn't waiting for you the, on the other side. God is already with you now. God is working with you now. God has promised you the blessing now. God has made promises to you for this life. God's not just saying, well, y'all just barely get along and keep the faith. And when you get over here, when I will tell you, oh, welcome, faithful servant. It is a lie to think that God doesn't have your back now. It's a lie. If you're wondering what, you, you know, some people say you never know what the will of the Lord is, then you might want, you don't have to say, don't say this to him really, walk in love. But in the back of your mind say, well, you must not read your Bible. Because he's plainly shared with us what his will is. He told us that to pray for his kingdom to come and his will be done to be in earth as it is in heaven. You could look, ask him, you might even ask him questions subtly and say, hey, how great will it be when we get to heaven? Oh, yes, brother. Yes, sister. It will be awesome when we get to heaven. Tell me what you think what heaven's going to be like. Well, is there going to be a sickness? Oh, no, there's no sickness in heaven. Do you think we're going to lack in heaven? Oh, no, the streets of gold in heaven. We've got mansions in heaven. Oh, it's going to be awesome. When we, it's going to be awesome when we get there. Huh. Well, praise God. Father, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So we have relationships and finances and property that have been promised to us for this time and in the life to come, eternal life. In 1 Timothy 4.8, It says, for bodily exercise profits little. But godliness is profitable to all things. 
having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So first of all, he's dealing with bodily exercise and it says it profit its little. Don't, don't let the verbiage of that in, the, in the, the translations get you. Bodily exercise profits you. There's profit to your health by doing exercise. I don't mean for y'all to go to the gyms and pump yourselves up and become bodybuilders and things along that lines, but we, you know, get out and walk. There is benefits to bodily exercise, but the benefits don't compare to godliness because godliness is not profitable just to your physical body, which it is to your physical body. It includes your health. It includes your physical body. But to all things, which is your relationships, which is your finances, which is your, your, the health of your soul, which that means depression. Your mind, can, you can believe to be smarter because godliness is profitable to all things. And it says that this having the promise of what? The life that now is. So here, again, I've, I've already went to two other places, but here's a third place that tells us, and it starts referencing that living for God, a godly lifestyle, ha, gi giving things up for the gospel's sake, dying to ourselves, believing God that we're supposed to believe for this, and it says it's a promise for the life that now is. In other words, it's not putting it off until we step in glory. It's telling you you have the right to expect the glory of God right here, right now. Godliness has a promise of the life that now is. Plus, we get to go to heaven. We get to see some loved ones that are waiting on us. The good thing about heaven compared to the world is heaven has no one to resist against you. When we get to heaven, we're still going to be living by faith. It's just there's, it's going to be so much easier to live by faith in heaven because there's no resistance. Why do you say you're still going to live by faith when you get into heaven? Do you want to please God in heaven? Well, you got to believe. you got to use your faith to please, please God. Third John 2. The Spirit of God by John writes this, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now, God wants your soul to prosper. He wants your relationship with Him to prosper. The relationship with God has to come first. You have to seek first the kingdom of God. But even when you seek first the kingdom of God, it says all these things, talking about even when in Matthew, when his sister makes reference to that, he says when you seek first the kingdom of God, he says don't worry about what you're going to eat and don't worry about what you're going to wear. He says the birds are taken care of and Solomon was dressed way, you know, the fields of the earth are being taken care of. They even look so much better. They, they look better than even Solomon and Solomon was one of the richest men that ever was. He said, God knows. God knows you have need of these things. God knows you have need of those things. But seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. So this is dealing with your prosperity. And most people say, well, you know, prosper means that you just, uh, you know, you increase in, 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 in things like your soul and your relationship with God. Your prosperity means, you know, that you increase in living a better lifestyle. Well, then why did it break it down between the three? Prosper, health, and the prosperity of your soul. And he's saying this about you right now. I, I wish above all things that you may prosper. Be in health as your soul prospers. The more you increase in the knowledge of God. The more you increase in the knowledge of Christ. That doesn't mean gathering information. That means increasing in knowledge means intimacy. 
With intimacy comes information. The more you get to know God, that's your soul prosperity. Has direct correlation with your health and the prosperity of natural things. Here's my last verse to put my case to rest. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19. It says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. I'm going to put that in Put that in context. I'm just going to read for you. I'm going to start with verse 12. And you start seeing the Apostle Paul is dealing with people that were starting to claim that there's no resurrection. And he says in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain or worthless. And your faith is also vain and worthless. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and, yet, and you are yet in your sins. Then, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since, the man, for since by man comes death, by man also came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterwards that, that are Christ at, at his coming. Then comes the end, and he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So here's the situation where I'm reading the context. is He was having to do some corrective doctrine to the church at Corinth because there was some people that come in and started preaching the doctrine that lines up with the doctrine of the Sadducees. The doctrine of the Sadducees, they did not believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. In fact, there was times that the Sadducees and the Pharisees approached Jesus and they approached them together and Jesus hit them with the question about the resurrection and then that caused the Sadducees and the Pharisees to be separated because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection from the dead in the afterlife. The Sadducees didn't. And so here's this doctrine has come into the church and is telling them, that there is no resurrection from the dead. And the Apostle Paul starts talking to them and saying, well, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then I'm a false witness and your faith is in vain and you're still in your sins because if there's no resurrection from the dead, then God did not raise Christ from the dead. And he says, and if Christ, God didn't raise Christ from the dead, he makes this statement in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ. So based on that doctrine and that statement right there, the Corinth church was still using their faith in Christ for dealing with things in this life. He didn't correct the doctrine of hey, everything's going to be when we get risen from the dead. He corrected the doctrine of there is a resurrection from the dead. There's more to than the, the blessings of this life. Because he says, if in this life only, we have hope in Christ. Which is to make a statement that in this life, we do have hope in Christ. But not in this life only. 
If it was just in this life, then you're right. We're just as miserable as they were in the old covenant. But we're under a better covenant with better promises, with a better footing because the sin issue has been done. And, and not only has it been done, but complete victory has been demonstrated by Jesus because he has been risen from the dead. And that resurrection power is operating now even in us. So his dispute with them was is that we have hope in Christ in this life and in the life to come. In today's times, it's gotten reversed to where we have no hope in this life. We, there's a lot of people that believe God. They believe God still answers prayer, but they've got to figure out a way to get God to answer prayer. There's people that, would, that look for people. That, I mean, it's on Facebook all the time now. But it was that way before Facebook ever came along. They started creating these, these big prayer chains. If we can get 10,000 people to pray, we're going to see God move. Well, the Bible says that if where two or three agree on touching anything on earth, it's done to them. It didn't say we're 10,000. The problem with 10,000 people when you say general prayers like that is you just gave 10,000 people the right to speak about your situation and you have no clue how they're going to handle it. Most of them are going to take your situation and go gossip about it. And you just open the door for it. Some of them will say, oh, Lord, we'll we'll pray for healing. And then they're calling someone up and saying, oh, so-and-so is about to die. Do you think they're believing for you? Woo-hoo! If in this life only we have hope, that goes to tell you that we have hope in this life. And it has, for a while, we went to another extreme because... Sister so-and-so who goes to church every time the doors are open got sick and died and no one can explain why sister so-and-so died. Am I here to explain why sister so-and-so died? The answer is no, because there's some things you just don't know. You don't know if sister so-and-so was harboring unforgiveness. Do you know you can come to church every single time and harbor unforgiveness? Man, I'm telling you, you get some self-righteous, self-righteous people, they love coming to church because that's part of their self-righteousness. I'm in church all the time. I do this, I do that. See, they're talking about what I do. And you cross them the wrong way? Woo-wee. They say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Try crossing the self-righteous person. Well, she was just the sweetest thing in the world. She got people saved all the time. She got people, new births happened to her all the time. Well, the, you know what? Sister so-and-so may have had great faith when it comes to the new birth. Because there's a lot. I mean, we've got brothers and sisters out there that are in denominations that they don't know what God's going to do about healing and they don't know what about God's going to do about provision. But they definitely know what God's going to do about the new birth. So they're very strong in faith about the new birth. And because they're so strong in faith, they're they're able to reach people and touch people with the new birth. And they're getting people to Christ. But they're not getting people healed because they have no faith when it comes to healing. And there's some people that are strong in healing. Faith in healing can receive their healing on a drop of a hat. Can minister healing, help people get healed. And the slightest financial issue pops up and it just completely blows them out of water. And you're looking at them and going, well, how can someone with such great faith have issues that they can't believe God for a pair of shoes? Because their faith's not in provision. Their faith, they know God as a healer, but they don't know God as a provider. Most, and it's so easy for us to defer our hope to heaven and put things off to heaven. Why? Because we don't have to. Because we feel like if we believe God for something in this time, that we've got to prove something. Let me help you out real quick. Like, you have nothing to prove. It's not you providing. It's not you 
healing. It's God healing. It's God providing. The whole point of faith is to enter into rest, to the place that you're so persuaded and, and reach the place that you believe you received that you're no longer worried about it. You're no longer making any effort about it. You're just sitting back on cruise control praising God because you know it's already been done. And you don't have nothing to prove to anybody. Some people get the message of healing, but they wait till they're in the midst of a huge attack. Let's see, you do a karate tournament, but you wait till you're in the middle of the tournament and say, hey, uh, can you teach me karate? You might actually learn karate that way. But you're going to get kicked and slapped a few times. And more than likely, you're going to lose a few matches. But if you leave those matches and say, you know what, maybe I need to learn karate. And you go train. And you go prepare. It's the same way with your faith. If you wait until you're in the midst of, of a battle... Well, what do I do if I've waited too late? That's why you go to a good church. That's why you have brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why even James says that if any of you are sick, call on the elders of the church. Because the reason he's telling you to call on the elders of the church, he says if any of you are sick, I find it interesting that he asked that question, if any of you are sick, like he questioned whether there's any sick people in the church. He's like, well, under those certain circumstances where there might be some sick people, boy, he didn't go to church in these times and in these days. He said there might be some sick people. Basically, if they're in an area of their lives where they don't quite have the faith to receive that for themselves, let them call on the elders of church and they will anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith. Well, if it's not their faith, then it's the faith of the elders. She'll save or heal the sick. So what do you do? You join in with someone. If you're in the midst of the battle and you realize, wait a minute, I wasn't believing God for this. I wasn't ready to believe God for this. There's no shame in that because guess what? We're all in those situations. But don't let them sit there and keep kicking you in the face. Run to someone. Will you help me believe God? Start running to the Word. Building yourself up while you run to someone else that can help you believe God through those situations. Because where one puts a thousand a flight, put two, put ten thousand a flight, and the threefold core is not easily broken. I didn't say do a prayer chain. I said run to someone that you know has got the faith for this. And then if you go to the person and they just are very sincere and say, I love you and I want to help you, but, you know, be honest with you, I don't quite have the faith for this. Then don't condemn them because you didn't have the faith to begin with. But, but hopefully they're at a place, you know what, though? We're going to go somewhere else and we're going to find someone that has the faith to get, get you through this. Because there's a promise for the life that now is. 1 John 5, 4, I'm closing with these two scriptures. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. It didn't say endures the world. Did it say endure the world? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Grace and peace. How many of y'all want more grace and peace? Be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The life that now is. Godliness is profitable unto all things. Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped 
the corruption that is in the world through lust. That we can be partakers of the divine nature. He's given us exceeding great and precious promises that we can be partakers of the divine nature. We've escaped the corruption that is in the world. The first step, and this is what I'm trying to do with you guys this morning, is just realize that God is interested in what's going on in your life now. And there are promises for the life that now is. And begin to start realizing as you're dealing with things in this life, that there's answers for this life that will cause faith to come. And this is the victory that overcomes the things in this world, this time, this season, our faith. Because we have hope in the life that now is. And we have hope for the life to come. Praise God. Do you make anything out of this? Anybody need anything? I'll pray with you. We'll join in prayer right now. Hallelujah. Y'all are sitting there deciding whether y'all need anything or not. We're going to say bye to all those on social media. Hey, we love you guys. Try to come. We'd like to see your face. I like seeing you on Facebook, but I would really like to see your face. So we're right here. Big Sandy, Texas, 719 North Tyler Street. For those that don't know Big Sandy very well, North Tyler is Highway 155 North. So just come and visit us. We're here every Sunday at 1030. We have Faith and Healing School every Wednesday at 7. And we'd love to, to just for you to enjoy the grace of God with us. If y'all need anything, reach out to us. You can reach out through social media. You can reach out to us through email. Uh, you can go to our website, godismyrefuge.org. There's some contact information there that you can look up. Reach out to us. We, we will do our best to pray and minister with you. You have a great day. We love you. Bye-bye.